while I'm not a professional historian, I hope I will be able to provide you some perspective on what's going on uh, and where this is loving and freedom obsessed nation is coming from and where are the ties to this Ukrainian land are coming from. So the uh, first people arrived to Ukraine 150,000 years ago. They came from a uh, Caucasus along the shore of the Black Sea uh, and from Balkans, again, along the shore of the Black Sea. We'll be jumping thousands and hundreds of years to make this interesting and a uh, short presentation. So Ukraine is mostly a flat country and it, uh, it is important also now when we see that uh, it can be attacked from any direction. Uh, but the important thing is that two-thirds of Ukraine is very fertile soil. Uh, it's called a black soil or, or Chernozem uh, in this area. And it's not a wonder that first uh, agricultural communities were established in Europe uh, in this area in South Ukraine between the Bug and Dniester rivers uh, for a, between four and five thousand years uh, BC. Slavic people began their journey uh, from this area uh, near the Carpathian mountains and the biggest, uh, strongest tribe of Slavic people was uh, Polanians. Uh, according to the legend, brothers Ki, Shek and Choriv and their sister Libit came to this area on the Dnieper river shore. So this is the Dnieper river uh, around 482 AD. And they established a city in this beautiful place and called it uh, after the uh, eldest brother Ki. And that's why we have Kiev here. Uh, Ki uh, Kievan people uh, had established uh, trading ties with, with Greece uh, uh, via the Black Sea and the uh, Greek cities that were established in Crimea and uh, on the uh, uh, northern shore of the Black Sea. And in 862, Norwegians uh, came and Scandinavians came from Baltic Sea through the river systems all the way to the Black Sea. They found this way and established a trading route between Greece, Middle East and Northern Europe. Uh, so Kiev was uh, in very good location on this route. It also provided its own furs and honey to this trade. And uh, the Varagans, the uh, Vikings, they settled here. The other name for them was Rus or Ross, Norsemen. And that's why that region became a Kievan Rus. Through the uh, 200 years of Kievan Rus existence, this uh, nation grew influence from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea and from the Volga River to the Danube River here. So it's a, it was the biggest state in Europe at that time. Mostly they dealt in trade, uh, so uh, using these rules that we described earlier. If we see here, there is a huge uh, plain where the nomadic people were coming from, uh, starting from a thousand years BC. And specifically what interested, interests uh, us right now is 13th century, uh, Mongol hordes came from here to this region and in 1237 they captured the East-South Slavs and in 1240 they captured Kiev. And that be, uh, was a decline of the Kievan Rus. Ukrainian people concentrated in this area, Galicia and Volhynia, and uh, this part of the Ukraine was at the time uh, almost deserted. A uh, hundred years of Galicia and Volhynia, after that they, they were captured by Lithuanian uh, kingdom and then by Polish kingdom, establishing what is called in history Polish Commonwealth. At the time, the uh, Mongol uh, declining empire, they receded to this area. Here we, we will have Ottoman Empire, the modern day Turkey, and in Crimea we will have uh, Tatar Khanate. And here will be the deserted fertile lands that Poles will very much want to move into uh, in order to produce uh, food for the growing population of the Europe. So at the time, peasants who lived here, they didn't own the land. They were, uh, f they have to uh, serve, uh, t they had to go to the nobleman's land to work uh, it one or two days a week. Uh, and that's how they uh, paid for their right to work their own land. 
what uh, Polish noblemen did, they offered uh, Ukrainians here, they offered uh, freedom from servitude, 10 to 30 years of freedom of servitude, much bigger lands, uh, in order for them to move in this area. So there was the people who did this were very bold. Yeah, they moved in the unknown area, which will be constantly attacked by uh, Tatars from the Tatar Khaganate. So the main, uh, the main uh, business of, of the Tatars here was slavery. They would capture slaves and take them to the vast Ottoman Empire, uh, who was con constantly in, in uh, the slaves was, was there in high demand. So over 200 years, from uh, 15th to 17th century, 500,000 people will, would be taken, uh, estimated, from this area to, to be slaves in Ottoman Empire. That's why the people who moved here, the, it was said that we, they would be plowing with their muskets at the ready. So they uh, knew arms, that had arms. It's a very unique situation as opposed to other peasants in, in a feudal year. Uh, also, at the time, the life expectancy would be 30 to 40 years. So, with 30 years freedom from servitude, these people would grow up free. They will consider themselves free, and they will consider themselves the owners of the land. Uh, and that's a very important thing uh, for Ukrainian self-awareness. So, they grew up here as a free people who, who protect themselves. And uh, that's when the uh, name of Ukraine was born. So Ukraine means borderland, or in American terms, frontier. So when we have, in American history, we have a western frontier. Here we have an eastern frontier. The border between populated Europe and deserted Asia. The border between forests and the steppe. The border between civilized uh, Europe and the nomadic, uh, less civilized uh, culture here. And uh, frontiermen who lived here, they also uh, they had uh, something very similar as cowboys. They would go hunt to the hunting expeditions, to the cattle grazing expeditions, into the vast steppe here. But as opposed to American history, they will meet a very strong enemy, organized enemy. They will need to organize themselves. Uh, so they uh, chose uh, their uh, leaders uh, based on experience. Uh, they organized in bigger and bigger parties. They built um, temporary shelters, which became fortresses at the time, and they became a military organization. That uh, that what we call a uh, Cossacks. So a uh, Cossacks, uh, they were also a democracy because that's how they uh, started. They started by choosing their own leaders. So they continued that. Uh, they had an election for the uh, main leader, that, uh, it was called Getman or Hetman. Uh, they, it was a shouting election, meaning uh, they would shout for the candidate and uh, whoever, uh, whichever party shouts the loudest, the, their candidate will become uh, a leader. But again, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a democracy. Uh, and they will, in time, not only um, not only engage in hunting, they will actually uh, consider themselves protectors of Ukrainian people. They will protect Ukrainian people from Turks. They were so successful. They would also uh, raid Turkish slavery cities. They will, would uh, make a slave liberation uh, raids in 1610, uh, Kefa, the most uh, famous ones. And in 1624, Istanbul the heart of the Ottoman Empire, they were bold enough to raid it successfully. But at the time, uh, they were uh, already not only protecting uh, Ukrainian people from Turks, they, they will, will be starting to protect the Ukrainian, Ukrainian people from Polish, a uh, Polish nobleman. Uh, because at the time, uh, the Polish uh, magnates, the very wealthy noblemen, uh, landowners here, they will uh, start to oppress uh, the, the peasants. They will demand not one or two days a week, they will demand five, six days a week of servitude. That's a huge toll on, on the uh, uh, peasant family. And a lot of people would run from, uh, from this region of Ukraine uh, and go to the siege, to the to the main uh, Cossack fortress, uh, where they can be free. And this area will remain more or less free till the uh, 18th century, uh, because of a strong Cossack state. 
So uh, who who watched Braveheart? Who who uh, who did see Braveheart? So uh, the Braveheart story is uh, very similar to what we will see right now. So as you remember, Braveheart is a um, uh, minor nobleman who lives uh, in the village peacefully, and then he decides to marry, and the noble comes and uh, kidnaps his wife, and that's how the uh, revolt starts. So the same thing would happen with Bogdan Khmelnytsky in the uh, uh, 17th century. Uh, he was a, a lower nobleman, Cossack captain also, uh, and uh, he would settle uh, down in, in the uh, mid Ukraine here. At some point, uh, he was married before he had a, he had a son. Uh, his wife, uh, wife passed away and he was to marry again. Uh, at that time, he went to some errand outside this, his uh, holding. Uh, the, noble, uh, the Polish nobleman will come and try to capture his land. Uh, kill his, uh, he will kill his son and kidnap his wife-to-be. Uh, Khmelnytsky tried to, to negotiate. He was wafted away by the Polish magnates and he started a revolt which will uh, be uh, the mo uh, one of the most important parts of Ukrainian history. Uh, so it started as a small revolt. Uh, in the year they will capture uh, all this area and almost get to Warsaw. Nobody knows still why they didn't, uh, they didn't go to Warsaw and basically capture the, the whole Poland. Uh, we don't know this. Uh, but uh, what we know is that uh, for six years, uh, Cossacks were uh, holding this land. And notice again the strife of Ukrainian people for freedom and independence. The minor chance that they uh, had, they will always take it. So at this time, they will try to establish their government here. They will transition the Cossacks into a civil government. Uh, the uh, Cossacks uh, commanders will, will start to be the regional uh, rulers and uh, things like that. But the problem, a military problem for the Ukraine uh, was then, uh, they was, uh, as it similar now, they were lacking tanks. The tanks of the day was the cavalry. So they uh, had to make a, make a deal either with uh, Tatar Kahanate here uh, or with the uh, rising Moscovite uh, state here. Uh, and uh, here we will see a, a very important thing. So. Uh, basically, the uh, Khmelnytsky and his uh, captains, they wanted to make a deal with Tatars because uh, the Ottoman Empire, they didn't have an interest in this area. So Khmelnytsky, as an um, uh, educated man, he realized that they will be uh, able to help the independence, to help the autonomy, and Ottoman Empire wouldn't be interested to capture this land. Uh, as opposed to Moscow Empire, who, uh, who at the time already pronounced themselves as, as uh, uh, owners of all this land. Uh, that was uh, their legitimacy for, uh, for their rule in, in the first place. Uh, so, but for the peasants, uh, peasants wanted to side with, with the Moscow Empire. Uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, they were Christians as opposed to the Muslim Turks. Turks were capturing slaves, and the deal was to uh, the Turks will capture slaves in a uh, in Polish uh, area, but what they did, uh, the, the easiest thing, uh, they, will, they will come to this area and capture Ukrainian peasants. And uh, obviously, that wasn't very appealing to the, uh, to the Ukrainian peasants. And the interesting thing is, why I'm telling you all this, that they held a meeting, they held a, a consultation of the Cossack elite with the peasants, with the lower Cossacks, and they went with a, with a lower Cossack opinion because that was a majority. Despite the fact, you know, the, the, through the all feudal history, noblemen will just uh, do what they want, not here. This is a deep democratic uh, route. Uh, so they went with a, with a peasant decision and they uh, made this a alliance with Moscow. The original document is lost, so we never know uh, what exactly was the terms of this alliance. But we know that uh, in a year, uh, Moscow already will start to act as if it was their land. They will negotiate with Poles, not even uh, inviting the, the Cossack uh, representatives to the negotiations. In 100 years, they will uh, dissipate the Cossack Dome completely. Uh, slightly uh, chunking off from the from the Ukrainian autonomy uh, piece by piece. Uh, 1775, uh, Catherine II will give an order to capture the uh, the main fortress, the siege, 
of Ukrainians and that was the end of the Cossack Dome. Uh, but again, we will see uh, chance after chance, when they have a chance to have an independence, they will take it no matter what. So uh, we will see them in, in 100 years after, after this happened, uh, Ukrainians will very much regret their decision to, to side with Moscow. The noblemen, the Russian noblemen who received lands here, they uh, put uh, Ukrainian peasants in much uh, worse servitude. It was uh, almost like slavery. As opposed to Polish servitude, they would own the people, they would sell, they would gamble away whole families. That was a, a very dark uh, part in the Ukrainian history called the ruin. Uh, Ukrainian language was oppressed basically through the 300 years of uh, uh, Russian rule uh, over Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian language would be sp spoken mostly by, uh, by peasants uh, and any, att any attempt for literally um, a development would be oppressed by the state at some point. In 1917, Ukraine again tries to, in the 1920s, they will try to get their independence, establish a state, establish the government. Soviet Russia will come and capture this again. In uh, 1944, after, after the war, uh, Stalin will decide that uh, Crimean Tatars who remain to live here, and uh, I wanted to say that uh, now Crimean Tatars, uh, despite the fact that we had wars, with uh, with Tatars and with Turks. Now we have a great relationship with uh, with Turks. Uh, Tatars are a very much welcome uh, a part of the Ukrainian community. Uh, Poles are, are the best friends of Ukraine right now. So that gives us hope for the far future, uh, for the uh, peace in this region in general. Uh, so in 1944, Stalin will decide that he doesn't want Tatars here, so he will just uh, come and put 80,000 households into the cattle carriages, uh, train carriages, and drive them all the way to, the, to Asia and settle them there. They will be able to return only in 1980s. Uh, 8,000 people will die during this, uh, this road. So it's a, it's a very uh, hard oppression. 1954, uh, the failing, economically failing and deserted region of Crimea will be assigned to the Ukrainian Republic inside the USSR, and that's how the Crimea became a part of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and again, as I said, uh, the, the minute they, uh, they got a chance for independence, they will take it. Uh, 1919, the Soviet Union dissipated, and on August 24th, Ukrainians will pronounce their independence. Uh, in 1994, uh, Ukraine will uh, give up the nuclear weapons that remain from the Soviet uh, uh, Union. Uh, they will be transported to Russia, and uh, the guarantees for Ukrainian, uh, as the integrity of Ukrainian borders will be given by the United States, United Kingdom, and Russia. Uh, and we know how that went. Uh, in uh, 2012, uh, uh, President uh, Yanukovych will be elected with a program of uh, uniting with the uh, European Union. Uh, but in 2013, he will suddenly refuse to, to sign the agreement with the uh, uh, European Union and he will announce that he will want to increase the ties with Russia again. Uh, so there was a student protest on the uh, Independence Square, Maidan Nezalezhnosti. The peaceful process was uh, brutally repressed by the, by the police. And then the Ukrainian people erupted in a, a much bigger uh, demonstrations. Because of that, uh, the, there was an agreement between the parliament and the president to establish the impeachment vote. Uh, but the President Yanukovych left before the impeachment vote would be uh, conducted on uh, uh, February uh, 2014. And on May 2014, there will be an election in Ukraine and the democratic process will be restored. Unfortunately, in this uh, three months, the awful thing will happen. In April 2014, Russian troops will enter Crimea. They will enter the cities here, Melitopol, uh, Mariupol, uh, they will uh, also enter here in the in the Donbass region. In Crimea, they will hold a referendum. The Ukrainian Navy would betray their country and side with uh, with Russians. It's a very sad uh, story in our history. And people would repel the the uh, spec ops that tried to capture this region.
So just simple people, because the uh, Ukrainian army was in shambles at the time. And uh, basically the Crimea will remain in the Russian hands. And the two republics will be established uh, here uh, unlawfully uh, under the uh, help of the Russian troops, uh, the Donetsk Republic and Lugansk Republic. And uh, that, uh, that's how the 2014 went out. So there will be a continuous fighting between the Ukrainian forces and, uh, and the uh, rebels uh, supported by uh, Russia here. So there was a fighting on the border. There were not, not any uh, attempts to harm the, the civil population. For example, 2020, 2021, uh, over two years, only five civilians would be killed by both sides uh, in this conflict. So it's really an attempt of uh, holding this border nothing else. And unfortunately, on uh, February 24th, Russian troops will uh, attack Ukraine from seven directions, uh, mainly from, uh, from the north, from the uh, southeast, from the uh, northeast, uh, and from the south, and try to capture Ukraine. And we uh, very much hope and pray that Ukraine will repel this aggression and uh, will even build a, a better peace structure for the whole world. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting Ukraine. Uh, you are wonderful. Thank you.